In the 1960s, when NASA was preparing to meet a tough goal of landing on the moon, Star Trek, the TV series, began inspiring viewers to even go further. For decades, Star Trek's fictional depiction of exploration, it's inspired the NASA workforce in our quest to venture out in the cosmos, but also inspired the country. Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, was certainly ahead of his time. Star Trek featured an unprecedented diversity in its cast members. It represented a bridge working together. NASA also embraces people to work together from all backgrounds. And in celebration of Gene's 100th birthday, I'm happy to introduce you to Gene's son, Rod Roddenberry, who will be moderating a panel with George Takei and some of NASA's best and brightest to discuss diversity at NASA and that visionary Star Trek bridge. In light of the exciting discussion you're about to have, here are some very fitting words from the man himself, Gene Roddenberry. The whole show was an attempt to say that humanity will reach maturity and wisdom on the day that it begins not just to tolerate, but to take a special delight in differences in ideas and differences in life forms. If we cannot learn to actually enjoy those small differences, take a positive delight in those small differences between our own kind here on this planet, then we do not deserve to go out into space and meet the diversity that's almost certainly out there. So in honor of his birthday, we're sending the words that you just heard directly into deep space. And it's going through our deep space network, NASA's network used to communicate with the faraway spacecraft that explore the heavens. NASA's deep space network is a truly global network. It has locations all over the globe. The deep space network is just one example of how diversity and cooperation can help us unlock the mysteries of this universe. And now, Rod Roddenberry. Well, first, I'd really like to thank Administrator Bill Nelson. Um, thank you so much for uh, putting this together and that uh, amazing announcement. So hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're here to celebrate uh, my father, Gene Roddenberry's 100th birthday. Um, not only that, but his incredible contributions and influences on society through Star Trek. Today, uh, I have the pleasure of being joined by an incredible panel of trailblazers who, like my father, uh, they're pushing boundaries, they're challenging stereotypes and inspiring a new generation with their spirit of adventure, courage, and hope. Now, as many of you know, my father uh, came up with Star Trek in the early, mid, mid to early 60s. And he had had a very unique life being a, uh, uh, a World War II bomber pilot, a police officer. Um, he, he had two major crashes in his career that he survived. Um, he, he experienced a lot uh, of life and saw the, the beauty of humanity and its darkness. And I think that really gave him the perspective to, to look at humanity and the future and come up with this idea of Star Trek. And, um, it was really built on sort of a, a backbone philosophy or principle of IDIC, I-D-I-C, which stands for infinite diversity in infinite combinations. And it, in Star Trek, it, it wasn't about a group of people going out to seek weird looking aliens. They were going out to find creatures in our universe that looked in the, at the universe in a different and unique sort of way because we had reached a point in our intellectual evolution where we understood that that we had to experience things that were different to grow and evolve, to live the same and only hear the same and not try to hear things that challenged 
our intellect, that challenged the way we saw things, we would never advance as a species. So, so Star Trek was much more than just a sci-fi show. And uh, I, I think some of the people that we have with us here today um, were also on some level influenced by Star Trek and in some way, perhaps even influenced Star Trek as you'll see from some of our guests. So I'd like to introduce our, our, our panelists. Um, here I'd like to start with uh, someone I think you guys know fairly well, but uh, George Takei, he is an American actor and activist, and he's definitely best known for his famous role as Hikaru Sulu in Star Trek. Um, next we have Tracy Drain, the lead flight systems engineer for the Europa Clipper mission at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we also have uh, Swathi Mohan, the Mars 2020 Guidance, Navigation, and Controls Operation Lead at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory as well. Now we have Hortense Diggs, Director of the Office of Communication and Public Engagement at NASA's John F. Kennedy Space Center. How you doing, Hortense? And last but not least, we have Johnny Kim, selected by NASA to join the 2017 Astronaut Candidate Class, a U.S. Navy SEAL, and holds a doctorate from Harvard Medical School. Thank you guys all for being here. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, well, I, I think we're gonna have a bit of a discussion, but I do have a few questions for you guys, if, if that's okay, if I can throw them your way. Um, and if you don't mind, I am gonna put George on the spot first. Uh, I've, I've known him the longest out of this group, so I feel a little bit more comfortable getting these questions going with him. I wonder throughout your years, whether they're conventions or events, but, but all the Star Trek things that you might have attended, the people you've met, uh, do you have, can you recall any stories of, of optimism? Um, I, 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 I'm often asked by fans, you know, has Star Trek actually changed the world for the better in, in its own small way? Admittedly, it is a, a TV show, but it has inspired people. Um, I'm wondering, George, if you have any stories or, or recollections of of something optimistic that you may have heard or run into in your travels. In the show, uh, you know, th at the height of uh, the uh, various social issues, we had uh, the civil rights movement going on. African Americans demonstrating for equality were be that who were being attacked by uh, uh, law enforcement officers. And, uh, and 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 uh, having uh, attack dogs and fire hoses uh, 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 used on them. Gene was inspired to uh, show how we can come get over that by using another metaphor. We had two alien uh, breeds uh, fighting each other. One was black on the right side and white on the left side. And the other one was black on the left side and white on the right side. And they couldn't get along with each other for that. And we had Frank Gorshin, the comedian, who brought those characters to life. And it, it really made that look ridiculous. And ultimately, with the perspective, hopefully not of another hundred years, we can deal with it. We are still dealing with it today as in the form of uh, Black Lives Matter. I was involved in the uh, civil rights movement. I marched with Dr. King. I did a, a civil rights musical and we, I sang uh, and, and Dr. King uh, 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 heard the music uh, from uh, what we call the uh, musical we called was Fly Blackbird. And so uh, that was, uh, optimistic uh, look toward the future, hopefully not that far in the future, but we will be able to recognize what Gene was uh, uh, telling us by working together in concert. Uh, it's an optimistic uh, sense. And here we are together today, uh, the rest of this panel uh, as part of the NASA team, we're uh, boldly going where we hadn't been, well, I, I've been for about two minutes <laughs> where you guys are going or have been, but uh, uh, it, it technologically, scientifically, and in terms of engineering, we are getting there. We're 
looking together in concert today for this brief hour, looking to the future as a brand new place where new possibilities can perhaps happen. Well, thank you, George. Um, that's beautiful. That's, that's awesome. I appreciate the, uh, the, the kind words and the, the kind words from my father as well. Um, I, if you wouldn't mind, I'd, Hortense, Swathi, Tracy, Johnny, I, I do have a question for you guys. Um, um, each of you do have the unique fortune to work at NASA, and, and you played a role in exploring our galaxy for real. Uh, and not to take anything away from you, George, you've explored uh, the galaxy in our hearts. Um, but what is it uh, about your work at NASA um, and, and, and what's out there, the unknown, that really inspires you? And I wonder if I can ask each one of you, and because your square's on my screen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, I think, Tracy in, the, in my right-hand corner, uh, if you're ready. I am ready. There are so many things about the work that I get to do with my team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that inspires me. And a lot of it is about what we get to go and explore and find. I think it's amazing all of the wonders that there are out in space that we could never have imagined. The, one of the spacecraft that I worked on recently, Juno, fl has flown over the North and South Poles of Jupiter. We've never done that before and literally didn't know what it looked like. And if the audience has never seen those images, please go take a look because there are crazy like storms up there, especially on the North Pole that has eight kind of equally spaced storms in this super beautiful pattern that you can see in infrared. And being on the forefront of helping the scientists as an engineer, helping the scientists get their data and see what our solar system is like is amazing to me. We're literally expanding humankind's knowledge of this backyard that we live in. And with the Kepler mission that I also got a chance to work on, it has really revolutionized our understanding of how many planets are out there in our galaxy. I grew up watching Star Trek and the idea of humans being able to explore different places really drove a lot of my desire to work in space. And knowing now that not just maybe there are planets out there, but yeah, the galaxy is like dripping with planets all over the place and ones that are in the habitable zones of their stars. So I find that to be super inspiring. That's beautiful. That's awesome. More, more planets. More planets. Uh, Hortense, do you mind if I uh, throw the question at you? What is it about your work at NASA and, and the unknown that uh, inspires you? Well, Rob, what really inspires me is, is people. Like a lot of us, people inspire me. And in the, in the Apollo era, era, which is the same time that Star Trek aired, we saw a huge increase in the number of students pursuing careers in STEM. And as was just stated, I am sure that this people on this panel, as well as others in the NASA workforce, were inspired by the fictional characters of Star Trek. And I would like to think that what inspired them was the, the diversity of the Enterprise crew and them working together toward a common goal which we all still remember, and some of us can repeat as uh, exploring strange new worlds, seeking out new life and new civilization, and boldly go where no one has gone before. So as I stated before, what inspires me is people working together collectively and committed to NASA's vision, which is to reach for new heights, and to reveal the unknown so that what we do and learn will benefit all humankind. You know, 60 years ago, children and adults were inspired by fictional characters and fictional technology. But today, people look to NASA and are inspired by real technology, real science, real innovation and passion. And as a NASA employee, that is truly what inspires me. That, that sounds like the embodiment of Idik right then and there, what you said, that, and that's incredible. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Swathi, if I can show that, uh, share that question with you. Absolutely. Uh, what, what is it that inspires you? So what inspires me is very similar to JPL's motto, to dare mighty things. You know, I grew up watching Star Trek and the part that I loved best about it was that for each episode, it had a way of turning what you thought you knew about the universe on its head and making you 
realize that there was so much more out there than what you could comprehend right now. And the vastness of the universe and what we know about it is so different that the part that excites me most about the missions that we work on is seeking out that knowledge in whatever shape or form that it may come in. You're seeking out the knowledge and understanding of the universe for that purpose of knowing in the first place. You know, it, it transcends company profits, it transcends country borders. It's really for the betterment of all of society and all of humankind. The latest mission that I got to work on is Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. And the main science objective was to seek out the signs of past life on Mars. Being able to work on a mission whose express purpose is to seek out the signs of life, very similar to the motto of, of Star Trek, goes to these fundamental questions that affect all of humanity of, are we alone in the universe? And as we start answering that, the answers to that have can have such a profound impact for society as a whole and has the opportunity to realize you know gene roddenberry's vision of getting people to understand that if we're not alone we're so much more similar and to appreciate the differences and come together not just as a particular race or species but as the whole planet to accomplish what we want to accomplish and to explore our universe. And once again, Johnny, last but uh, not least, um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, what is it about what you've been doing that uh, inspires you, your, your contributions and your experiences with NASA that have been inspirational to you? No, this is great to hear the pers various perspectives on what we're inspired by here at NASA. And in general, I'm inspired by human efforts that accomplish hard things, especially for the betterment of others. And that's a really general statement that can be accomplished in a lot of settings, not just in space exploration, but in particular in space exploration, we seek hard things. Human space exploration is hard. Learning about climate change is hard. Doing experiments in microgravity are hard things to do. We're not, humans have not, are not physiologically able to survive in space. So doing these, these things require grand human efforts in planning, in execution, in engineering. And so that's why I love and am inspired by NASA that we work as a team just recently, we had some challenges, some unique challenges with the space station. And we, as an international team, collaborated and worked together to solve that problem. And so that's what we do here at NASA on a daily basis. And uh, it's for the betterment of our Earth, as well as for humanity, all while inspiring the next generation of kids, of explorers and leaders and scientists so that's what I'm really inspired by at, here at NASA and uh, why it's just a phenomenal place to be. The whole goal of NASA is to promote that exploration. And like I said, for knowledge sake, when you look at the solar system as a whole, you look at the planet as a whole, it does transcend all the boundaries. It provides a platform to explore the universe and bring that to the masses to show that what we can accomplish if we work together. When we landed on Mars just earlier this year, we landed amidst huge societal changes with Black Lives Matter, with the in the middle of a pandemic that was raging our country, when people were so uncertain about what they were going to do, whether they were going to survive, if they could even go outside their their doors for one reason or another, and to see the world come together in an accomplishment that really had ties across the world with scientists on multi different nationalities from vendors across the country from diaspora on all aspects of the planet from Hawaii to Argentina to India to Philippines in one room coming together to have this accomplishment of going to another planet for express 
purpose of exploring, not to colonize, not to seek profit, but to learn. And that learning benefits all of society. It gives you an anchor to plant your flag that people can rally around. And just having that opportunity and a platform to plant that anchor gives one more leg for society to have the opportunity to rise above those differences and have something to come together around that can help them reach for the positive aspects and to see past those differences than to focus on the negatives or the things that divide us. And I appeal to you young people with your knowledge of science and uh, engineering and mathematics to bring that kind of intelligence to dealing with the issues of our times here. And I just, you know, it's wonderful that we're going out there and we, uh, did inspire with Star Trek and Gene Roddenberry's vision, the importance of, uh, of infinite diversity and infinite combinations coming together. But also we need yet your kind of minds working on the problems, the so uh, social justice problems that we have in our society today. I think your point might be, and then I'm gonna stop talking. I know Horny Horses is gonna chime in too. No, is don't that stop. Don't stop. Oh, yeah. so. That even if you agree with the notion that the kind of challenges and endeavors that we're doing in terms of space exploration are a unifying force, and that's great, I think your point is don't assume that that's going to do all the work just behind the scenes because, like, actually put some mindful thought into it, be thinking about how we address those problems head on, as well as doing the exploration that we're in the midst of. Correct. Yeah, I like what um, Tracy said, and it kind of hits on one of the topics that uh, that's near to dear in my heart is the the diversity in the teams that we have. You know, diversity in the the science, technology, engineering, and math uh, pipeline is nowhere near as equal as it could be. The opportunities uh, in the pipeline to encourage young students, especially those from minority backgrounds to actually pursue science and technology, to stay in that pipeline throughout it, to even get to a point where we at NASA can hire them, uh, could definitely use some effort and, and love to just to feed that pipeline. And until we can get equality in our teams, we'll never really fully utilize the people, the whole society, that we could because we won't have the diversity of mindset. We won't have the diversity of thought that will really allow us to think outside the box to solve these, these hard technological problems. We have innate bias to hire people just like us and it takes effort and conscious effort to, to step outside that and to be able to say, no, it's useful, it's valuable to have diversity so let's go make an effort to make sure our teams and our people reflect society as a whole so that we can really capitalize on all the different backgrounds of how people have been brought up and think, thought and experience that will help us to solve the real challenges uh, and the real hard challenges that we can potentially unlock if we can get to that equality in the diversity of our teams. I was going to say, uh, just follow up what you said. We say, if we can, we can definitely get there, but we have to be intentional about getting there. And, and it, is a, it is a circle of things that happen. We talk about inspiring underserved, underrepresented minority young people. But as I stated before, most of what inspires people is people. So until we bring... <laughs> some diversity to the teams now, and we have no excuse for not being able to do that. It's not that we don't have people from diverse backgrounds who have gone out and majored in these STEM fields and could be an excellent asset to NASA and what we do, but for whatever reason, we're not being creative enough to go get them and bring them to us so that then we can then inspire future generations to follow in our steps. So it's not an impossible, it's something that we have to be intentional and work hard and don't give up on doing it and, and do it. 
We do it just like we want, just like Johnny said, we want to explore for the betterment of humankind here. We have to make that same decision that we want to have diversity for the betterment of humankind here. Hortense, I, I completely agree about being, the uh, aspects you talked about being intentional. And uh, while it's not perfect, I think here at NASA is we have done a phenomenal job of being intentional and marching towards that representation that reflects our society. The astronaut corps itself is a diverse, diversified group. And our Artemis mission, which as you may know, is our return to the, to the moon to stay, is going to have the first woman and the first person of color on boots on the ground on the moon. And I mean, that's why, you know, when I was growing up, I had a picture of the Apollo 11 crew over my bed. But as I told you earlier, I have never once thought to be an astronaut. All I wanted to do was be a Navy SEAL, but I didn't think that people, and even doing that endeavor, I hadn't met many Asian SEALs before. I had never met an Asian SEAL before that. And that's just, when we don't see someone that we can relate with in, the places we want to be or the, the the things that we're striving to do we just don't think about doing it it's just the way it is and so i never thought i could be an astronaut i didn't think people who came from my background or, um, or, or people who looked like me could do something like that but then i was introduced i was exposed to that idea and i think that's what we do here at nasa is, is we strive towards that representation and to do bold things and to do them together you know, Johnny, that's, uh, you know, when I was a kid, um, my understanding of NASA, JPL, and the other, you know, aeronautics and, and space-related agencies, industries, um, were really about technology and mechanics, just rockets and, and getting people up into space. And I think what everyone here has done so well is, is re-educate me on NASA and again, JPL and all the related industries are much more than just that. The way that uh, you guys have, have spoken about them and, and the work that you've done and who you've done it with and the fact that it's not just a U.S. or an American uh, quest anymore. It, it is a global sort of effort and that we're working with agencies all around the world to, to do these things. Um, that that is, I mean, at least from my point of view, that is the epitome. That is that is the United Federation of Planets. That is Starfleet. NASA is the beginning of that. And and I'm sorry to bring it back to a fictional story. Uh, the world is not about Star Trek. However, from my point of view, my my interest in celebrating my father's centennial, um, I do love the United Federations of Planets. I do love the future where we no longer have borders between us. Uh, uh, literal borders between us, but we, we've embraced the differences among us. And and for you guys to to share that the projects you've worked on, the projects you've been involved with, uh, involve people of all walks of life everywhere around the world, and that we need more of that is what I hear everyone saying, and I, I think we all agree with that. Uh, I, I, I couldn't be more proud uh, not necessarily to be an American, but to be part of a group that has NASA, that has people like this who really believe in our future of unity and thrusting into space together. Uh, that is what I'm proud of. And um, I, I thank you guys so much for, for, uh, for sharing your, your, your history, your background and what you've been working on and, and how you perceived and, and experienced uh, NASA, JPL and the other agencies. Um, I, I do have one one last question, and it's really just to to maybe get some background. I mean, you guys have shared the things that you're working on now, but I kind of want to know how how did you get into what you're doing now, and and what inspired you to get there? And I guess if I'm leading this, I'm going to start with uh, with Johnny first because Johnny, I've I've picked last so far every time. So Johnny, <laughs> please, Johnny. Uh yeah, I, I guess I'll give a, a shorter answer on this, but I, um, it's a good question, um, how I got here to where I am today. I, as a boy, I 
had a lot of challenges growing up and I wanted to become the best version of myself. And the path that I was on as an adolescent was not leading me there. And I didn't feel like I had an identity. I felt in between worlds, um, perhaps many people, many panelists on this can, can feel, can understand that my parents were immigrants and, uh, Culturally, I felt in between worlds and uh, something about the warrior culture of becoming a Navy SEAL really called out to me. And uh, I tried it. I discovered a little bit of who I was. I discovered the goods and the bads of humanity, of human struggle. And I was inspired to become a physician from there. And in doing that, I found NASA. I discovered NASA as a platform to do what I love to do, which is seek hard things, challenging things to push beyond limits, but at the same time, make the world a better place. And George, you said you're an optimist. I'm an optimist too. And I balance that. I try and balance that with a sense of realism. And for me, it's important to inspire the next generation because they are our future. And that's what it means to me to be here at NASA is that I have an opportunity to do what I love, to do the hard things, to explore. But more importantly, I get that opportunity with my fellow astronauts, with all of my teammates at NASA to plant the seeds for those young children watching at home who get to see us do the impossible, to work together to achieve the impossible. And that's what I really enjoy about being an astronaut here at NASA. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, if I can hand it over to you, Swathi. Yeah, how did I get to where I am today? Um, it's interesting, Johnny, when you say you felt like you're in between worlds, I definitely felt like that growing up. Um, I was a child of immigrant parents. I came to the US when I was one, and for the longest time, it definitely felt bifurcated. I was one culture when I was at home and one culture when I was at school. And to get beyond that and get beyond what I thought an appropriate career path would be for me. I thought I was going to be a physician all throughout growing up. It took a lot of soul searching and being honest with myself as to what I was really passionate about and what I was really good at. Like not to be, not to take in what I thought I needed to do or how I thought I needed to be based on my upbringing or my culture, but what I really wanted for myself inside. And the the space exploration called to me because it was that final frontier of, this is the place where we really can go and build the better world to find the, the aspects and bring out the best of all of us and being able to contribute to that goal, to contribute to seeking the knowledge of this final frontier was very exciting to me. You know, I had the privilege of being the voice of EDL for the Perseverance landing and the feedback that I got after it of all these young students of so complimentary of seeing me and the expressions of wow, now we think we can do it because we actually saw someone else who was doing that. Uh, we're just inspiring and and serve to remind us that we're not alone. And even if we think we're just one small piece of a big puzzle, there is some paid forward responsibility where even if we're not, you know, in charge of anything, the opportunities we have from working in the field and just paying it forward to bring the future generation. We never know what that impact can have down the line of a phone call with a student to give a piece of advice or just shaking a hand, you know, in, in a conference to to spend time with a little kid who who wants it. That exploration and motivation for others is also what drives me to give forward and to use space as a platform for inspiring others. Well, thank you, Swathi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hortense, if I can direct the question of what inspired you to get into the field you're in and where you are today? Wow. Um, 
I had no desire uh, to work for NASA. I, I didn't even know about a NASA, to be honest. And what I wanted to do up until probably my junior year in high school, I wanted to be a pediatrician. But I grew up in a time where in my family and those around me, everyone was a teacher or a general practitioner. And mm -hmm. so you tend to to want to do what you see others because that's what you you know. But I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. And I want, like I said, wanted to be a pediatrician because I've always loved working with uh, with kids and with students, but I didn't want to be a teacher. But I talked to myself out of going to school, majoring in biology to be a teacher. Why? Because I didn't see anyone that looked like me that was doing that. But I had great math grades. So I, I received a scholarship to Prairie View a &M University in engineering. And to be honest, guys, I didn't know what engineering was. I was like, what? Is that the man on the back of the train? Well, well I'm way too cool for that. <laughs> And my mother, in her wisdom, said, I don't care what it is, they're giving you a scholarship, you're going, and that's what you're going to do. So, you know, of course, while there, I think, okay, this not, is not bad. I, I, I like this. And so after graduating, I, I started my career uh, with the Navy, or, Naval Ordnance Station and then got married and needed to relocate, came to Patrick Air Force Base. And there was NASA. And I was like, oh boy, they have one of those back in Texas, where I'm from. I need to get over there so I can get back to Texas. So that's really how I got to NASA was a desire to, to move back to Texas. But after taking guys nine years to get on with NASA, I, I no longer had a desire to go to Texas. But I loved NASA because it allowed me to do my passion. Remember, my passion was wanting to work with students, and NASA had this office called Education. I'm like, okay, what do they do? <laughs> and I went over there, and I love their mission. Their mission, going out, telling students what NASA do, all in the hopes of inspiring them to go into STEM. It was just such a full circle fit for me a job that I would do for free. <laughs> and so I just loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. So I absorbed myself in that. And as a result of that, just got opportunities for other things and took advantage of those opportunities. So to go back to what Johnny said about loving the speak, that is what I love. I believe that we have to talk to these young students because we love our astronauts and they see them. But NASA is so much bigger than our astronauts. So I want to make sure they know about the other things that are out there so that they can find a passion for what NASA is doing and be inspired to one day join NASA in our exploration. That's amazing. Yes, yes. That sounds amazing. Uh, Tracy, if I could throw the last question at you there. Yeah, so how did I end up at NASA? I got to say, usually I don't talk about this piece of it, but uh, Johnny and Swathi are reminding me that I also was a person who was kind of between two worlds. I grew up in a predominantly Black neighborhood and a working class family in Kentucky. But from second grade and on, I went to, to schools that were in predominantly white neighborhoods. And I was usually the one or maybe one of two black kids in class. That's why I sound like this, by the way. <laughs> like, the rest of my family does not talk this way. And it's, it's interesting to me that actually the idea of not seeing someone like myself and therefore not thinking that I couldn't do that thing, that was never a thing for me because I so identified with the kids and the teachers that I was around all day that I, was, I just assumed I'm just like you guys, like everybody else is. Now, there's a double-edged sword to that because I was also a bit cut off from my own people's culture and history and only started learning about that in my 30s or so. So I'm really not saying, please do that to all the kids and it'll be fine. Like that's not the answer. But the thing for me um, to, to bring in on something that um, I think either Swathi or Horton said 
my mom was a very big influence on my path because she loves Star Trek. She and her sisters, the four of them would run home from school to watch because the oldest sister looked like Uhura and they're like, wow, there's a black woman on TV in Star Trek, let's go watch it. And she got firmly sucked into science fiction and raised me and my brother on that. And so around high school when I was trying to decide what I wanted to do, I decided I wanted something to do with space. Like that would keep me interested for an entire career and allow me to help the world be more like this awesome Star Trek show that I grew up with, even if we can only move the needle a little bit in my career. So I studied mechanical engineering in undergrad and then grad school and was very, very fortunate to do an internship at NASA Langley when I was in undergrad, um, the, the same center where the ladies from Hidden Figures were from. I had no idea about that history until the book and the movie came out. And it was astonishing to me that I had been walking those same halls and just had no idea about all that that had taken place. And I was very fortunate to get hired at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory right after grad school and have been there for my entire career. And for me, even though I personally have gotten to work with a lot of people from so many different backgrounds and just educational experiences, trying to put together these complex missions, it's been wonderful. I'll, I'll tag on to what Hortons was saying about the importance of talking to students and letting them see like all of these things that they could do. And it's not just about the scientists and the engineers and the astronauts. We have people who are artists full time who work at the lab and lawyers and computer scientists and teachers and communicators. And no matter what it is that you are passionate about doing, you can find a spot in the space industry if you want to combine those two passions and help us as humankind go off and explore our surroundings in our universe. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away, guys. I, I really am. Um, the, the entire conversation, your answers here, uh, and, and truly, uh, at, at my age, being able to look within and see a bit more uh, NASA and the space industry and, and how it's run today and the kind of perspectives uh, it, it embodies and, and shares and, and, and the people who work there. You know, I started this by saying people would always come up to me and say they were inspired by Star Trek. Um, I am so happy to hear and want more that people are inspired by you guys. Um, you guys are an inspiration, the way that you talk about not just your agencies and where you work, but why you work there and your belief in the future and your belief in humanity. And, and that is, you know, again, from my point of view, what Star Trek has always been about, uh, you, you guys are, are doing it for real, not just going into space and not just getting people into space. But again, Star Trek was more than just sci-fi. It was about humanity's future. And uh, you guys are incredible. And, and to hear what you have to say, you, you, are, you are helping us work towards a better future and you are the inspiration for other people to want to make that better future a reality. So I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I can't thank NASA for letting uh, me and the Roddenberry Foundation uh, uh, talk to you all. I, I, I thank you and I'll do this. Live long and prosper everyone. And I will sum it up by saying, celebrating Gene Roddenberry's 100th birthday with all of you absolutely convinces me that history is yet to be made. And it's going to be made by all of you. <laughs>